Welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, we're going to give it here just another minute or two while attendees make their way into the classroom. Uh, but you are here in the right place. Um, I know there was uh, some audio issues with that video, which is pretty uh, pretty standard with videos on this uh, go to webinar uh, platform. So uh, you can also view that video or share it with your uh, pet parents if you go to YouTube and to our PAC channel. So if you're interested in, in seeing that uh, with the audio that is available to you, um, let's just give it one or two more minutes uh, as attendees make their way in and then we will get started. Okay, well, I have 11 o'clock here on the East Coast, so we will go ahead and begin uh, today's webinar. First, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. My name is Jess Zelmer, and I am one of the board members for PAC, and uh, I will say we're just super thankful to have everybody joining us. We know it's a busy time for pet care centers. Many people are are in the midst of their spring breaks. Uh, so super, super busy, but we're glad you took the time uh, to come here today. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about PAC for those of you that might be uh, new to this great organization. And then we will get started with the main event uh, with Bill Hillis from Social Pet Hotel. Um, but before we get started with that, let me tell you a little bit about PAC. Um, PAC is a independent testing and certification um, uh, in the pet services industry. Um, it's our mission to make pet care safer for pets and for humans. And uh, given today's topic and also healthier in terms of finances. Um, so PAC is here to, to um, evaluate all parts of your pet care center. We really feel at PAC that there is a need to raise the bar of safety in our industry. Um, our industry is uh, frequently clouded uh, with accidents, many of them preventable, and we just want to make pet care places safer uh, for everybody that is involved. Um, and so how we are doing that is through a third party certification. So you might ask yourself, what is a third party certification? There's so many educational materials uh, that are available to us, which is fantastic. Um, such a wealth of knowledge out there in our industry. There's no shortage of that. Um, but there is a very big difference between third party certification and certificate programs or education educational materials that different uh, groups will sell. And before I even go any uh, further with this, we always like to emphasize at PAC that we um, uh, believe in all types of education, uh, whether it's third party um, certification uh, that you're using to uh, test your knowledge or any of the certificate programs. Um, we are fully supportive of all types of uh, education materials that are out there. But third party certification, what PAC is doing is very different from anything else that is offered in the pet care industry. So how is it different than the typical certification program? So certificate programs that you see out there, uh, usually what you do is you pay for some sort of content. 
Um, you study the content, you work through the content, you take a test at the end, and you print out the certificate that you can hang on your wall. Again, fantastic. Anytime you're increasing your knowledge level, it's a good thing. But what's different about third-party certification is it's not just about studying material and printing out a certificate. Um, third-party certification requires professional experience. Um, somebody who uh, says, oh, I want to get into the pet care industry, can't then just go to PAC, take the test, and hang the certificate on their wall. Uh, Third-party certification requires some level of professional experience. Um, it's awarded by a third party, as it says in the name. PAC is a not-for-profit um, entity. Uh, everybody on the board, including myself, is a volunteer, and it really is just about elevating the profession. Uh, nobody is making any money off of PAC, I assure you that. Um, it's, a, it's just a lot of very dedicated volunteers that are working uh, and have been working for many years uh, to bring this uh, to fruition. And I think one of the other bigger differences between certificate programs and third-party certifications is it does require continuing education, which is part of why we are here today, um, to be able to offer our PAC certificate holders access to free education material to um, achieve that continuing education requirement versus third-party certification. Uh, once, you, once you earn that certificate, you can kind of print it and have it on your wall forever. Um, uh, but this does uh, ensure that pet care providers, um, managers, owners that are certified by PAC are receiving some level of, of continuing education. Why is PAC important to you and your business? Um, it's an end to the industry for that matter. Most professions require independent certification. Okay, when you drop your kid off at school, when you um, take somebody to the doctor, all of those people's knowledge has been uh, verified through a certificate program. Going to the dentist, your, your CPA, your hairdresser, all of those people have some level of um, certification and pet care really should be no different. People are entrusting us truly with members of their own family. Um, so having a certification will bring our industry to the next level. It's a competitive market right now, a little bit of a tough market, been through, uh, given everything that the world has been through. So it's a really a great way to stand out uh, from your competition is to have that certification and to be able to show that off to your pet parents and to your community. Um, it's a great way to bring uh, your employees to the next level, get more qualified employees, um, team members into your pet care center. We hear so many complaints if I can't find um, good people to work for me. I can't find people that want to work. Um, this will give them um, some investment into a pet care career and really elevate uh, your pet care business as a great place to work and a professional place to work. And building trust with your pet parents. We had a great story uh, the other day. I don't think it was pack related. I think it was it was um, from another group that I'm a part of. Um, but uh, somebody's pet had died at the pet care center um, of old age and just something that we all just, you know, hope that never happens to us. But it did happen to this pet care owner where a, a pet had just happened to pass away while they were at the pet care center. And um, a few days later, the pet parents actually sent uh, the, the pet care team uh, at this pet care center, flowers and a sympathy card. Um, and you would just think, oh, you know, they weren't upset that this happened or, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, expecting sympathy for themselves. But the pet parent had so much trust um, in this pet care center that they also knew that this team was grieving too. And that really is a testament to how much those pet parents trusted on that pet care center. And I think PAC can be a part of that, building that trust factor with your pet parents, that you're doing everything you can um, to uh, make your place a safer uh, pet care business.
to be. Next exams uh, coming up in June. You need to register by May 12th. Uh, we also have a, a date in November need to register by October 13th. If you're not quite sure if PAC is for you, join a study group. Uh, we have the PAC exam study group. You can, you can type that exact thing into Google, or I'm sorry, into Facebook, and you will come to our exam study group. And the other thing, I would just encourage you, reach out to PAC. This board this year is super hands-on. We are ready to tackle any issue, ready to help you register. If you need one-on-one -on -one help to register or someone just to chat with you, um, go to our website, contact us, and we'd be happy to call you or text you and walk you through any questions that you have. Okay, without further ado, because I've taken a little more time than I should have, Bill, um, but here we go. Um, we are so thankful to have Bill Hillis today, uh, again, from Social Pet Hotel and Daycare, um, a great pet care center located uh, in North Carolina. And I'm going to pass it over to Bill. He can tell you a little bit about himself and get going with the great content that he has for us today. Thank you, Jess. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can, I'm going to show my screen here so everybody can see it. And Jess, if you would let me know when you're well, viewing that. Yep, we are all set. I see your screen. Awesome. All right, everyone. So um, I've asked Jess to kind of give me, um, she's going to share the CEU credit about 15 till 12. And that'll be kind of my cue to wrap up and leave some room for questions. Um, so let's dive in. If my Prezi will work here. <laughs> Sometimes you have to click on the screen first. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Now it's now it's moving. All right, give me a moment and let me restart this. It's all a little slower when it streams. Okay. See if I can uh, dive down to the introduction here. There we go. All right. So I. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with everybody today. Uh, my wife, Amy, and I operate two locations of Social Pet Hotel and Daycare. Um, we opened in 2014. We are not a franchise. We are founded on an idea that we could deliver um, higher quality pet care in the same sense that, uh, that folks deliver child-based care, um, but to, to dogs, to canines. We we're successful at Pineville enough to take the risk and open a second location in 2017. And we offer primary services, daycare, lodging. We have a spa, which is our grooming center, as well as canine preparatory school, our training programs. And these are all offered at both locations in Pineville and Charlotte. And just for those of you that aren't familiar with the Charlotte area, um, the town of Pineville is literally in the same county as Charlotte. These two locations are about a 30 minute drive from each other. So all within the same, same vicinity. And you can see our um, locations there on the, on the left of your screen. Um, we uh, certainly want to be a home away from home. Uh, we've kind of got a modern farmhouse look in the Southeast that goes pretty well. I think Chip and Joanna Gaines would be pretty uh, excited about what we did here. Um, a little bit about me. Um, there's a whole list of things that I've been involved in, including the, uh, the army. I was deployed to Afghanistan. Um, always knew I wanted to get into business. Amy and I got married and then um, I went on to get into commercial property management. And then while going through an MBA at Queens, uh, my interest uh, was piqued in uh, pet care and mainly because what we saw was such a demand for quality care and places that were, in our opinion, being run in a fairly mediocre way were thriving just because there was so demand and there were really no options. So um, we felt like we got in at a good time, but we also feel now is a good time. So the only other thing I want to mention about me before we move on is that um, I am not a CPA. Um, I'm an, an investor, a business owner, um, even though I do have an education in business management and leadership. Um, you know, the goal of this presentation is to share with you all some high level reasons why it's very important to pay attention to your financials um, and and. I believe, and I think the industry believes that we're primed for a really strong recovery moving into this year. And so to ensure that you know where you're at today, where you're going tomorrow, and how you're trending, the number one way to do that is to make sure to pay attention to those financials. Um, so 
IBPSA, um, the International Boarding and Pet Services Association, is founded and run by Carmen uh, Rustenbeck, as well as an amazing team. And I share uh, this organization, which is uh, closely um, works closely with PAC because it is important to know, uh, and there are other organizations out there, but there, there's a lot of advocates. You wanna build a team around you and you wanna seek resources um, that are there to support you as a, a manager and owner of a pet care facility um, or and to be the best operator you can be, you need to know what's going on out there um, internationally and nationally, depending on where you're from. Um, so th these are Carmen words from her Q1, um, the uh, Pet Care Pro Quarterly. And so right here in the middle, she says, I propose that we stop looking for normal and start taking action to move through today successfully. In order to do that, we must look back before 2020. So for those of us finding ourselves in 2021, wondering when we're gonna see the days of 2018, 2019, um, I, I, I would agree with Carmen 100%. We have to move forward. We have to look past that. And we have to prepare ourselves mentally, physically uh, to do better uh, than we did last year. Um, so here's some sources and here's some data that um, I think is important to look at when we start to identify, before we go into the financials, um, I chose these because there are some sources that you all may or may not be familiar with, uh, Wakefield, Morgan Stanley, Grandview Research, the Wall Street Journal, and um, here's some, these, these are interesting points. This is in 2020, the structural increase in pet ownership, more than 11 million pets found new homes. That is within the year of 2020. So while the pandemic was raging, uh, pet care, in some in some aspects, we were priming ourselves for the future, and we and and I know at the, about this time last year, it certainly was not on my mind um, what kind of incredible base could be developed um, in the depths of this pandemic. But a lot of people were staying home. The people, folks that uh, uh, were not experiencing significant financial hardship, um, they took the opportunity to find. Uh, new animals to love, and um, dogs and cats were a the majority of that. So pet care sales could reach 275 billion. That means an annual pet spending per household at 1,292 dollars by 2025. That's only four years from now. And 70% of millennials, um, millennials being the most, uh, you know, the largest group of pet care owners who are projected uh, to be seeking services from a qualified pet care facility, um, they are looking for a higher standard of care. So this is one stat that stood out to me, um, that 70% of them are looking for accommodations that are large enough for their animals to exercise in, their dogs or cats to exercise in. So the idea that a traditional kennel with traditional crates uh, would be satisfactory, uh, if your client base is of an older generation, all day long. Um, as you look to transition or the transition happens, um, that generation phases out. Uh, predominantly, the folks that are going to be owning and paying for pet care are going to be that um, 20s through 50s generation um, age bracket. That is moving, the sweet spot is moving more and more toward the millennial group. So it's important to understand what they are looking for. Um, why does this matter? Because if you do have predominantly crates in your facility and we have crates in ours, you wanna start thinking about, okay, what does that mean in three to four years? I need to maybe set aside some dollars or have a budget that projects needing to make some capital improvements to ensure my accommodations fit what my clients are looking for and future new clients will be looking for. Uh, the next thing they're looking for is connectivity to the facility. So um, there are many, many ways to do this. One of the most traditional ways is video webcams. Now I am not promoting the use of those uh, video webcams in a facility, but I point that out as one way that you can have your parents be better connected. Um, a more technical, you know, as technology has advanced, um, there are uh, services out there that can connect uh, the human directly with the dog, no matter where the dog at is at or the human is at. And I think that technology will continue to progress. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how those providers are able to cater to pet care facilities like ours. Um, so small pets are more likely to be humanized than large dogs. So um, there are a lot of facilities out there that are looking at 
how to grow their revenue base, how to increase cash, set aside more for a rainy day. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But, uh, you know, you want to think about how the spend differs between large dogs and small dogs. On average, statistically speaking, small pets are more likely to have that greater spend. Their parents are more likely to see them as an extension of their family. Of course, this is not true for all dogs and all families out there, but generally speaking, this is a pretty interesting stat. Um, and then the last one, most importantly, and the reason why as hard as 2020 was, Social Pet is nowhere, uh, we're only 50% of where we believe we can be. We are. We see a very bright future in front of us and uh, spending increase of 134% over the next 10 years is um, is something to get excited about. So we wanna be ready for that. And I wanna share uh, some thoughts upcoming on how to best prepare and, and grow as the opportunity presents itself. So first you wanna look at yourself. We want to say, what are we doing to make sure that we're prepared as owners, leaders, uh, business managers to take care of our team and our clients? And selfless leadership means that you put yourself first. It does not mean in every time that you that you're last and that you're 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 going to sacrifice your work life balance. You're going to sacrifice those moments of solitude you need, those walks with your own dog. Um, for the sake of the company, for your clients or your people, what you'll find is that actually will unfortunately can catch up to you in a negative way. And uh, and and the worst thing, you know, on the on the worst end of it, you might start to dislike your business. So uh, hopefully, that um, what I can share are some kind of break down some of these barriers on the financial side, so that you'll feel more comfortable asking the right questions and understanding your business a little bit better. And then ultimately, you're going to be able to hold your people accountable. Um, they should be making your life easier, not creating additional headaches. Ultimately, you want your business to be able to operate uh, not on the shoulders of any one individual. Um, if you are finding yourself wanting to take a weekend off or God, you know, take a, a week off even, and, um, and you're struggling to do that because you're trying to work around the schedule of one or two other critical people in your business, that may be a good place to start is how do I succession plan and how do I build a team around me that can operate independently uh, and have several people that are ready to take charge in an event where you cannot be there. So self-care is really important. Um, so what do we do? We're gonna check our pulse. And this is kind of the meat of what I wanna talk to you all about today. Um, we've got several different financial statements that are very important uh, when you go out to get lending just to satisfy uh, you know current situation whether you have a lease or you own your building somebody generally speaking is tied to you financially um, and if you do own everything outright you still have an obligation to your employees you have an obligation to your clients um, if you sell packages in advance and somebody comes for a refund you need you know that has to be clearly articulated um, uh, and you have to have a plan for covering uh, those costs. So how to check your pulse. Um, we first wanna look at 2020. What things did you have to put in place to make sure that you were solvent financially, you had some cash in the bank to just survive this unknown. And so I know for us, we had contacted lenders, vendors, um, we had fought, we had some short-term deferrals, some payment reductions. We also had some contract cancellations. So this is now, if you haven't already, um, and, and I am making an assumption here that, that um, generally speaking, you're at a point where you are seeing, you're not maybe seeing growth uh, from 2019, but you're seeing an uptick from last year and you're able to, uh, you're getting a few lodging clients, your daycare program's grown a little bit. Maybe you've introduced training or grooming or retail, some other revenue source, and, and you are financially viable at this point. Um, so if we, if we take that as a baseline, you wanna just double check as you reconcile everything and you're going through tax time to make sure that you have uh, become current with everybody that, may uh, that you may have worked with earlier in the pandemic to try to shore up cash flow. 
Um, if you're not yet at that point, you still want to reach out to these lenders and vendors, and you want to make sure that um, you're looking overall your full expense picture. And if you haven't yet recovered, you are being able to set some money aside um, by taking on some of these facility maintenance uh, contracts yourself. And what I mean by that is, for example, when the pandemic hit, I, ha I, I literally went to our locations and, and started taking care of the landscape. That's one example. Uh, I certainly have now hired a landscape crew to come take care of that so I can focus more on this and be here with you today. But um, you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, the last part of this and how you know kind of how you're doing and um, once you have these conversations with your lenders, vendors, and other folks that help you um, uh, supply your business with equipment and materials, um, you want to make sure to look through your financial results. So what do we look at and how do we look at them? We've got cash flow, income statement, and balance sheet on the left side. Um, these three statements are really the lifeblood of an organization, especially a small business. And, and whether your business does 100,000 a year or 100 million a year, these statements come into play. Publicly traded companies use these same statements as, as we use in our small business. Um, and uh, there are several programs you can use. I use QuickBooks Online and have a bookkeeper and a CPA tax accountant. And, um, and it allows us to communicate really freely no matter where we are. Um, there are other programs that are just as good, but um, what I'll be speaking from and what I'm gonna show you some spreadsheets they were for what it's worth um, produced through that QuickBooks software. So a cash flow. Cash flow is arguably the most important financial statement that you're gonna look at on a regular basis. And, and from my perspective, cash flow needs to be the one that you look at um, at least every two weeks. And a good rule of thumb that I've found is that you wanna look at your cash flow before a payroll. So if you do your payroll like we do every two weeks, then every two weeks is, is most likely going to be frequent enough. If your payroll is on a weekly basis, um, then you I would I would recommend that you look at cash flow on a weekly basis. Um, that does require maybe a little more effort as far as coding and making sure everything is in your accounting software correctly. So you can view this document um, that if you are in a situation where you don't feel like you can keep up with that, that's when you want to think about maybe getting a bookkeeper or having a family member or somebody else in the business help you maintain that. So you can know without a doubt, without just looking at your bank account to see how much literal cash is in there, what has happened to that cash. Um, so to ensure that you're on firm footing so that you can invest in your business moving forward, you want to make sure that you have a, a fairly healthy cash cushion. There's different ways to go about doing that. One most obvious way is retained earnings um, or an injection from the owners. So ideally, once you're operating and once you're moving forward um, and you're, you're making more than you're spending, you're taking a part of that after you've paid yourself and you're putting it in some type of savings account. Um, different size companies, different uh, requirements. If you have loans, there may be structured requirements from your lender as to how much cash to have in reserve. Generally speaking, three months is good, six months is better. Beyond that, it's definitely good to talk to your CPA, have them review this with you, and come up with a number, a target number for you to have in reserve for the next unexpected thing that comes about. And this is not about um, look an outlook that is negative my outlook is extremely positive but you just don't know what you don't know and despite all of the economic relief that is out there by different governments you there's still you are dependent you're you are dependent on by your people to run your company in a way to ensure that it's solvent no matter what comes down the pike so what has ego got to do with it um i read a book called ego is the enemy uh, by Ryan Holiday, and my wife Amy actually gave it to me, and I, I don't know if she was trying to tell me something, but she was successful if that was her goal. Um, and uh, it it really it really rang home because it's it's easy when you're doing well or when you feel like okay, we've been in business for several years now, things are going great, you know. Then all of a sudden, this this macro event happens. It's out of all of our control that impacts everyone uh, the same in some ways, very different in others. 
And what's really important to do is not to begin to get comfortable again without ensuring that you have these contingencies set in place, you have a cash reserve that's strong enough. Um, it's not just about you being able to sleep at night, it's about your CPA and the rest of your team uh, making sure that you can take care of them um, for an extended period of time if we were to um, it, you know, go through something similar in the future. So different, um, uh, different groups are represented here. I know we have members from Canada, New Zealand, the US. Um, I pulled some links to uh, the Department of Finance, um, the Treasury, um, essentially the financial body represented by these countries that has put an economic response plan in place. In every instance, there is funding out there for small business. And what is important to note is that even if you were fortunate enough to be in an area or have a service line that was not impacted by the pandemic, you may still qualify for uh, some stimulus dollars or uh, an economic relief loan of some sorts. There are also grants out there. So don't assume, I guess, is my greatest message here. We qualified for some things. Um, we qualified for both rounds uh, of, of stimulus in the United States. Uh, Paycheck Protection Program is what it was called even though by the time the second round come about, came about, we were on much better footing. But for us, it still made sense to take advantage of that program, uh, especially since there's the forg forgiveness element to it. Um, it's, it's all to make sure that we can invest and, and have a good cushion to take advantage of what we think will be a strong spring and summer travel period. And uh, we will be sharing this presentation. So if you don't have a chance to write that down, um, first off, I'd recommend a quick Google search. Secondly, I'll be more than happy to share this presentation so you all can pull it up um, so you don't have to uh, take notes on it, everything. Um, so here is the cash flow statement. So this is an example statement, Dana's, Diana's goat grooming. I don't, I'm not sure if you can groom goats, but I was intrigued and this was a simple statement, so I thought we'd use it. Um, so a cash flow statement is a measurement of how well a company generates cash to pay its debt obligations. Positive cash flow indicates that a company has liquid assets and that they are increasing. So that means that, and, and in layman's terms, what that means is if you have a net income of $60,000, if you can see that at the top of the screen there under cash flow from operations, that means you had $60,000 after uh, that's your gross revenue, less all your expenses, and it should be after you've paid yourself as owners. Um, some people, uh, some owners do not take a salary. They just take a distribution at the end of the month or end of the quarter. Um, generally speaking, it depends on your level of involvement with the business as to whether that's recommended or not. If you are operating within your business, um, if you're a key person in your business on a day-to-day -day basis, you certainly should take some level of salary. Um, not only is that, um, you know, the IRS has a lot to say about that, your CPA can kind of guide you. Um, a, a good example, too, is, it, you know, a, a minimal salary for, for a pet uh, care tech. Say you're back there in the yards, you're training dogs or scooping poop, and that's your normal job. You know, you, sh you should pay yourself a, a wage that's similar to what your people that you've hired and you pay make for that job. If you are running your organization uh, and you have a manager that works for you, you should be paying yourself a little bit more than that. Um, so the the reason I talk about that is the 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 value of the statements has everything to do with the data that's put into them. So if you're not including your own take home pay, and that take home pay is critical to your well being, to pay your mortgage or to buy your groceries, then you're really not seeing the full picture. Because if your net income goes down to twenty thousand. Um, is that truly left over and a true cash uh, excess that can be reinvested? Or from that point, are you still taking money out of the company? Now, if you are, you're gonna see that down under on the cash flow statement. If you filled it out correctly, you are gonna see owner distribution show up here on a month to month basis, depending on when you pull the statement. Um, 
But um, generally speaking, companies with strong financial flexibility can take advantage of profitable investments. And, and what that means is when you see opportunity coming down the pike, for example, if you see that transportation is going to be critical to your viability as a business moving forward, because there are still significant restrictions on people moving around or doing business face to face, you may want to invest in a small van to transport dogs to and from parents' homes, even for daycare. Um, or a mobile grooming service. That is something that if you want to be able to invest in to take advantage of that opening or that opportunity in the market, you've got to have the cash to do it, generally speaking. Um, so first thing you're doing is you're looking out at what government uh, opportunities are out there that you could secure legally. And, and, and to do that, they're going to want to see this cash flow statement. They're going to want to see, okay, what what are you doing with those funds when you get them? Um, so if you go down here through net income, you'll see uh, depreciation, increase in accounts receivable, increase in inventory. If I'm Diana's goat grooming, I'm a little concerned if I'm her CPA and I see accounts receivable uh, in the month of January went up $20,000. I'd want to call Diana and say, hey, what's going on? Let's see if we can collect on some of that. Uh, purchase of equipment, it's the beginning of the year. None of this looks at, uh, you know, none of this would be concerning depending on the industry you're in, depending on what you knew happened that prior month. But this gives you one single snapshot to know um, how much beginning cash I had, how much ending cash I had, what's the difference and where did it go? So now we're going to talk a little bit about the income statement. Income statement is synonymous with a PL statement. So if you've heard, Somebody talk about their profit and loss, P&L, income statement, net income, net operating income, all of those things are kind of fall within this profit and loss uh, statement. Um, the site that I've used for a lot of these resources is Investopedia. And so if you have a moment or while you're listening to me, if you want to pull up another uh, side screen and just Google investopedia.com, um, if you literally type in that search, and you look up PL or balance sheet or cash flow, you're going to get a lot more information, tons of information and takeaways from Investopedia. This is a really quality source uh, to, uh, to look up financial information like this and then to dive into some of these ratios that are that I'll share. So the PL is a financial statement that summarizes your revenues, your costs, expenses incurred during a specific period of time. And if you remember on the cash flow, you had net income. Net income essentially is the is the result. It's the end of your PL. What you end up with is your net income. So let's look at the dirty details. All right. It is slow. I hope you all can see that. Um, what is critical? On the right and the left of the center blue bubble, I've got page one and page two of a detailed uh, PL. And this is actually taken from one of our P&Ls, our Charlotte location, and I've rounded out a lot of the numbers. It does not represent our financials except for the format and the, some of the categories to kind of help you understand the level of detail that I like to look at on a monthly basis. Um, what is critical to keeping up with your P&L? Uh, one thing is weekly coding. At worst, you want to code, you want to make sure that all of your expenses as they come through are categorized before you need to review the cash flow. So whether that's bi-weekly or weekly, um, that can take up some time, especially if you have multiple locations. Uh, more than likely, if you're doing over a million dollars a year gross revenue, the amount of expenses, time and people it takes and the effort to run it, you probably are in need to think about getting a part-time bookkeeper. Um, the cost of which is can be a lot less than you might think uh, especially if you're lucky enough uh, to source uh, somebody that's uh, in college for uh, or working toward their CPA, um, or there's plenty of CPA groups out there that offer bookkeeping at a lower billable rate than they would their tax preparatory services. So um, it is worth every penny you spend to make sure that you have financials that are accurate so that you can then make good decisions based on them. Um, the next thing is a detailed chart of accounts. This is the categories or the codes, if you will, that you're going to categorize each of your expenses and your revenue lines to be seen on your income statement. And this matters because 
if you if you simply have a line item that says revenue and a line item that says expense you you really have no idea month to month what is causing that to go up and down so you want to have it granular enough so you can see specifically where your money is being earned and spent cost of goods sold is the last thing that you want to make sure that you separate out when we opened our business we did not have cost of goods sold which in pet care services it's primarily labor separated from our other expenses so we weren't really getting a good uh margin uh gross margin number so let me let you see fantastic feline facility and this is a a true chart of accounts which are those uh the letter the left side of your of this um statement you can see boarding daycare grooming each of these uh, would in theory have a code. If you use QuickBooks, you literally can just select that category as it's shown right there and identify that dollar amount that came in your checking account or on your credit card, whatever the account was and identify, select that it was boarding revenue, you click and then it falls in that category. So that on a week to week basis, you're adding up all of these revenue lines and let's say in Q1, you earn $60,000 in lodging revenue. I know some of you out there would be like, God, I wish uh, that I could even see $60,000 in a year from lodging revenue. I know we felt that way about this time last year. Um, and again, these do not reflect our actual numbers in Q1. These are fantasy and I tried to make them kind of rounded so you could see. Um, for the purposes of a service, pet care, and this could be uh, if you do cats, dogs, guinea pigs, does not matter. You want to have your uh, income broken into uh, more detail than just simply sales or gross revenue. And you can see I've got four main revenue lines, boarding, daycare, grooming, and training. And then we do have a refund line. Um, so in, in, in some cases, you have to issue a refund for whatever reason. You want to make sure that's cap captured separately so you can actually see how much money you refunded if you don't have that line it will just be deducted within the software and you won't necessarily know well is that number growing or shrinking and it may be important if if it's it's steadily growing there may be some other issue that you want to identify or you want to bring it up with your team to say hey why are we having to refund more this quarter than last quarter um next you're going to get so that's going to give you your total income then you're going to have cost of goods sold and i've split this up into labor and non-labor cost of goods sold uh, labor includes everybody, including your assistant manager down. You can put your manager in there. Generally speaking, cost of goods sold is the cost of whatever the period is. So let's say uh, on a month to month basis for the month of January um, or let, for this in this instance for the quarter uh, for you to deliver your services within that time period, it costs you $88,800. And if you go down here, then non-labor cost of goods sold within that time period, you needed so much dog food, cleaning supplies, dog supplies, treats, and grooming supplies. The total of all that came up to, excuse me, Prezi, there we go. The total of that came up to 91850 And so you subtract that from your total income, and that's where you get your gross profit. That is a really important number to look at. And if you see to the right, I also encourage you to pull these reports showing percent of income. And generally speaking, it is it is I in our industry and what we've experienced is that our target is 40 percent or less cost of goods sold. That is a lofty number, um, especially if you're wanting to deliver a high level of service. It, it is it, it does not it is I'm not suggesting that if your number is above 50 that you are not delivering a high level of quality service and that you necessarily need to change something. Um, th this just gives you a metric to understand, okay, what percentage of my gross revenue is being taken before any other expenses just to deliver that service. So these are, another way to put it, your largest variable cost of your business is your labor, your cost of goods sold. The more services you sell, the more it takes to deliver those services. So you should see your total sales, total income fluctuate roughly at the same degree that your cost of goods sold fluctuates. Phil, Underneath cost of goods, good, so go ahead. 
Yeah, we do have a question related to that. If I could interrupt you, um, you mentioned the total cost of goods sold. This participant um, wanted to know if you would um, speak to, um, you have 42% here for labor. Is that what you, is that what you typically aim for in terms of labor versus revenue? Do you have a recommendation there? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. I would say right now um, we are invest, and I can speak from our experience at Social Pet. We're investing in uh, what we believe is going to be hopefully a very strong spring and summer. We actually were so blessed to be booked for spring break week, which is actually the week we're in. And for that reason, because we're coming off the heels of this pandemic, um, traditionally speaking, and it was true this year, the winter time, we're lean months. Um, we're at about 50% right now, um, cost of goods sold. Um, our target is to be below 45%. And I would say by uh, June, July, we're gonna be around 42, 43% cost of goods sold overall. Um, and then when we get back into the fall, that'll increase a little bit in the middle of uh, Thanksgiving through Christmas, th those holidays, the holiday season around mid-November to the end of December, will be back down to that 43% mark. Um, so it's going to fluctuate. It's gonna, it also is driven uh, a, a lot by the amount of training that you have to do. If your team was very lean moving through 2020, I know as ours was, there's a lot more training that we have to do right now, which means you got two people on one shift, maybe doing one job until the, you know, both of them learn it. Um, that's gonna in, increase your cost of goods sold. But generally speaking, 43%, to 45% is a good target number um, once you've stabilized. And, and I would also say your occupancy, generally speaking, um, it, it also your prices factor in too. There's a lot of variables, but um, if, if you have a higher than 50%, you've either got one of two things happening. You either are uh, have to look at your labor, but a lot of times you gotta look at your prices. How much are you discounting? What are your rates are? Did you have a, a price adjustment last year? Probably not, we did not. But this April, actually, as of April 1, we adjusted prices at Social Pet. Um, it, it's, um, you know, that can, it, it all depends on where your region is, where your city is, um, as far as managing and navigating this pandemic. Um, but a healthy, healthy number would be around 45%. Great, thank you. That's a that's a really good question. And um, th there's, uh, you know, the challenge I have uh, is that there is so much detail that I could share that uh, we almost need to make this thing two parts. <laughs> um, but I, I will be happy to share this example PL. And I would encourage you to maybe compare this chart of accounts. This has been honed in quite a bit over the last seven years. And, and we're very happy with kind of the categories we've selected to be able to manage our expense as well. Um, and it does, it works for us, uh, but we're constantly working on it um, and it does change year to year. Um, so we talked about cost of goods sold, gross revenue, um, gross income, and now we get down to total expenses. So your cost of goods sold is generally your um, variable expenses. Your fixed expenses are generally under this uh, quote expense category. Uh, so total expenses at 57,000. Um, if you subtract your total expenses and cost of goods sold from your, your gross revenue, you get your net operating income. And what we've chose to do is we actually put the owner salary, owner business travel, pretty much any expenses related to Amy and I in the other expense category. That way, when we look at NOI, net operating income, we can see how did the company perform um, without any of our added expenses uh, in there. And again, this where it says owner salary, $10,000 for Q1, that is not representative of anything. It's a, it's a nice whole number to give you all an example. Um, and then down here at the very bottom, net income, that should be bottom line, this is what you made after everything so that you know, the bank knows, uh, your future lender knows, everybody knows, um, especially the IRS, um, how much you actually made that year. Um, what is after net income is gonna be debt service. This numbers also can be uh, called EBITDA um, 
earnings before uh, depreciation, amortization, and taxes. Um, there is there's a couple things that are going to go, you know, after that number. So you you certainly, if you're in the negative when you get to net income, you you certainly are going to potentially be in a tough situation on a month to month basis moving forward. And that's when you refer back to your cash flow to see, okay, how much cash do I have in reserve? Uh, just because your income statement is negative does not mean that you have a, a poor cash situation. The opposite is also true. Just because you're showing a profit on your income statement does not mean that you're, from a cash perspective, your business is profitable because the income statement is a snapshot in time. If you had $49,000 on March 31st and then on April 1st, a payroll came out for $60,000, on April 2nd, you are now $10,000 in the negative. So it's really important when you're looking at your own financials, when you're looking at somebody else's, or you're looking to invest in a company or even stocks online, when you see an income statement, you have to remember that this is just a snapshot in time. A company is continuing to operate even af you know, after this date. So um, everything that happens in accounting is in arrears. All right, so what do you wanna look for? Here's two good ones that I think any um, anybody starting out should really pay attention to. Per dog revenue, which is your gross revenue divided by the total number of dogs, and that's not dog visits. This is um, this is actually, if, if Fluffy came three days a week uh, and uh, four weeks out of a month, you wanna count uh, one for every one of those days that Fluffy came to Social Pet. So for example, in let's say the month of March, we had 1,500 individual uh, reservations where the dog booked, checked in, checked out, and paid for that service. We're gonna take that total number, let's say um, 1,500. Let's say in that month, we made $100,000. We're gonna take $100,000, which is a gross revenue, divided by 1,500 dogs, and that's gonna give us how much we're making per dog in that month and then where you actually get to learn something is when you start trending this and you look month after month is your per dog revenue growing shrinking or staying the same and then you it can help you make some decisions uh percent gross revenue if you noticed if you remember on that uh income statement the percent gross revenue is your gross revenue your total income and then uh your expense category when you compare the two you're dividing your expense category by that gross revenue number to know what percentage that expense category impacted the bottom line. So I'm gonna back up one. If you see, um, let's take the NOI, net operating income, is 28% of total gross revenue. Net income is 23%. Generally speaking, most people would be pretty happy with a 23% return, uh, if you will, on revenue for that period of time. If that number is in the signal digits, generally speaking, that's it's going to be uh, you're in a tighter situation. There's less room for error. If you're if you're 15, 20 percent or greater net income, that that's pretty pretty solid uh, situation. But the reason you want to look at trends is are you 23 percent this quarter, but you were 43 percent last quarter. That's where it becomes more critical. Um, you want to see you want to see positive growth trending upward on a month to month or quarter by quarter basis if you see the opposite you want to know why did you invest heavily in training for that month is it the middle of february and you had fewer dogs than you expected but you you know you want to keep your quality team employed and taken care of those are things to consider and i'm going to talk about balance sheet real quick we're getting close to our time um, let me go through this, Jess, and then we can share the CEU, and then um, I can uh, wrap up. Um, the balance sheet's a financial statement that provides a snapshot of what you owe, what the company owns, and who they owe, uh, as well as the amount invested by uh, shareholders. Um, it reports the company's assets, liabilities, and shareholder equity. So let's look at this real quick. and instead of an example of an actual balance sheet because you guys probably already have a headache by now i want to show you this infographic 
these this is essentially what your balance sheet is going to share you and this is also found on uh investopedia um this is a really simplified way to look at your assets liabilities and your shareholder equity and, and assets and liabilities your assets are going to be your cash inventory property liabilities taxes um, anything you owe somebody else uh, payroll um, if you rent or even if you own the property but you have a loan out uh, that's a liability to the lender shareholder equity is the owner's money invested or retained earnings so um, if you've put in fifty thousand dollars and you have a net income of fifty thousand dollars the company has a total of $100,000 in that quarter at its disposal um, of liquid uh, uh, shareholder equity. So those things, uh, a balance sheet does what it says, it actually balances. So it helps you understand the flow and the investment you've made and where it's allocated. Um, cash on hand is critical to cover debt service uh, but how much should you have? That's what we already talked about um, in the cash flow piece. But when we think about having these conversations with our CPA, you want to ask specifically of them, how much cash do you think I should have in reserve on a week to week or month to month basis? Um, your lenders, they're gonna look at this and they're gonna look at your debt to equity ratio. And that's essentially uh, your total liabilities divided by your shareholder equity. So that's how much you owe other people divided by the value that is within the company that you own. Um, and then your short term versus long term for each of those things. So generally speaking, a short term liability is going to be a year or less. Think of a credit card, company credit card. A long term liability, you want to think about your lease on a property. You want to think about a, a loan on a on a you know service van that delivers the dogs um th those are good examples of that and again um investopedia.com you're going to learn a lot more about balance sheets you're going to learn a lot more about um what that snapshot provides and uh also helps you provide uh kind of provides you enough education to ask some educated questions of your cpa or bookkeeper to make sure that you're understanding these financials better. Jess, do you wanna go ahead and share the ECU and then I can uh, try to wrap up here? Yeah, so we'll share the CEU code because we do wanna make sure we provide that before uh, we hit noon. CEU code is C as in cat, C as in cat, 210228. Again, C as in cat, C as in cat, 21 zero two two eight i'll also put that in the chat box um bill's probably going to go a little bit over today um uh, and i went a little bit over so so uh so we'll be a few minutes uh past noon eastern if you have to hop off at noon remember this uh recording will be sent to you in the next couple days so you can catch that last few minutes uh there in addition um once he's done with the content we'll review the questions uh that have been asked and those will also so be on the recording. Um, feel free to stay on past noon. Uh, this content is excellent, Bill. We are getting a lot of really, really positive uh, comments. So thank you so much. And uh, anything you missed today, if you have to get back to your busy day, will be on the recording. And I'll throw it back to you, Bill. Thank you, Jess. And I, I want to appreciate everyone that's uh, stuck in with me. The information I just shared, it's hard to make it engaging. Um, but it is so critical, so important. Um, I, I, however, do ask for about another uh, five to seven minutes. I wanna share a little bit about, okay, so you see these results, right? On a month to month basis, you say, okay, well, I need to create a greater cash reserve. I wanna see a higher net income. Um, I, I wanna make sure that my debt to equity ratio is more than covered. So when, my, when I go to buy the building, that I operate in, my lender looks at me twice and is like, you know what, you're a shoe in. Of course, we can qualify you. There's ways to go about moving each of these each of these um, numbers in a positive or negative way. And so we want to try to talk about the relationship. So the first and greatest way to increase your cash flow is to create raving fans. So new client calls. I'm just going to share a couple of tips that we've done um, or that we're working on that have really helped us increase 
our financial performance. And, and one of the main things is actually start to treat your pet care business like a business. Think of operations as not the only thing you do and the most critical thing that takes up all your time. But think about that as just one aspect of your business. The other key aspects, just kind of like we have three financial statements that are pretty critical. You don't want to forget about any of them. Cash flow is probably the most important. Let's just say operations. Yes, you've got to pay attention to your operations every single day. It's critical that you get operations right so that those great clients that come in return. But you also cannot take for granted your sales and marketing efforts. So new client calls, if you're taking those at the front desk, you really want to think about trying to get your phone off the front desk for new client conversations so that you can really take the time and explain why you're different, why you're great, why you're going to care for this person's dog and really get to know them without being interrupted by the client that's right in front of you. Um, that being said, if your phone is on the front desk and that's your best scenario right now, you obviously want to take care of that client that's right in front of you first. But that could be why you're struggling to gain those new clients or create that trust from the beginning because your, your team is really not able to take that time necessary to build trust in those first couple of conversations because they're just trying to keep up with what's already going on. Um, so communication is key for new, current, existing clients, everybody, including your team, between you and your team, you have to communicate. So you wanna do that through every means possible. Everybody knows we just went through a pandemic. They don't need to be reminded that it's not normal anymore, but they need to be reminded that you are open and you're ready for business. You're here to support them and you wanna let give them peace of mind. And so here's an example of something that we put out on a routine basis, frankly, to remind our clients what we do in a little snapshot that can have them feeling comfortable and know, know that their dog is safely cared for um, while they're at Social Pet. If you are still discounting, I really, uh, I want you to take a hard look at why you're discounting. Um, one, sometimes some people, you know, the mentality is, well, I can't afford not to discount. I'm gonna argue that I don't think you can afford to discount uh, in, in many cases. And when I say you, I'm speaking from, from my experience at Social Pet. I mean, we we just did a price adjustment in a April 1 that was effective um, in part because we're delivering an even higher value, a higher quality of care today than we were pre-pandemic. We have introduced things like valet drop-off, and I'm gonna go to the next slide here, curbside um, pickup, drop-off, messaging, um, so we can you can instant message with us. Um, we also do care calls. If we haven't seen the dog within 30 days or more, we're going to give that pet parent a call and just say, hey, how you doing? Um, you know, now I, I've got to say we're not, uh, you know, I'm not saying we don't have some clients that we might, we might end up 60 days out if we get super busy. But generally speaking, on a quarter by quarter basis, if we haven't seen the dog come through the door, we're going to do our best to reach out to that parent and see how they're doing. This takes time, effort and energy from your team. Um, and it costs money to do that. So if you're providing any level of service like this that you weren't providing pre-pandemic, that's real cost, it's real value you've created for your client and you should be compensated for that. Uh, the next thing, peace of mind, I spoke about this. Uh, I wanted to bring up this uh, software called Canva. If you guys have never heard of it, I don't get any kickbacks or anything from introducing Canva. I'm sharing this because it made it so easy for my wife Amy really took the lead in creating some of these infographics um, and that are easy to post on social media on your website and have people understand what you're doing that's making a difference for them and why you're the best place for their pet to go during the pandemic and after the pandemic um, and so that's that's what that is and the last thing I want to show you is 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 just or remind you all that you are a destination unless now there there may be folks on this call that are pet sitters folks that uh, work you know that that uh, work on the side for a company like Rover um, in any in any uh, instance where you're selling your services if your services are based out of a location or a facility that facility needs to feel like something special it needs to be a destination all five senses need to be activated when that when your client shows up parks their car they should they should immediately be enveloped by the experience that you're creating um and and that is our goal at social pet every day and we certainly were able to take 
the opportunity in 2020 after we kind of caught ourselves to um, invest in some general maintenance, in some facelift, also um, in, uh, in music, in scent, uh, landscaping, all these little added touches that make it feel like something special when you roll up, not to mention a quality, well-trained staff that's happy that you're walking through the door. So looking ahead, we have a lot to do each month to make sure that we're on track and also to gut check ourselves. And if you remember when I started, ego is the enemy. The worst thing we can do is make assumptions that we're doing well because our quote numbers are up, but we may or may not be making money at the end of the day. That's why it's so important to perform your R&M, your repair and maintenance on your financials as needed. It's so important to have a bookkeeper or make sure you set aside that time yourself on a weekly basis to make sure to code and keep your financials updated, not just looking at your checking account balance before payroll to see if there's enough to cover the difference. And I'm not saying I haven't done that before. We're all small business owners, especially if you started from nothing, that certainly comes into play sometimes, but at some point you wanna graduate from that and you wanna start working on it and not in it. Overall occupancy and financial performance, we've talked about that. While the month's extending from mid-April through Labor Day, are historically our highest grossing that didn't happen in 2020 it was it was abysmal but we've got to move forward we've got to look uh at the positive side and see the light here um and i know depending on which country you live in if you live in canada certain provinces you can't cross provincial lines um in america it depending on which city you live in which state you live in there's different restrictions it is not fair to benchmark yourself against another facility in another region, another state or another country. Don't do it. If you're gonna benchmark yourself, you wanna benchmark yourself against you, your performance last year, your performance in 2018 and 19, and look to just beat yourself. If I can recommend anything, try to just get back to the gross revenue number that you saw in two th when you closed out 2019, but maybe you're coming about getting to that total, by a different way. Maybe lodging is not helping you as much, but maybe training, daycare, grooming, maybe they, maybe you're doing a little bit better there. Look at yourself, look inward, don't look around and, and, and compare yourself to what other people are doing because you just don't know their situation. So lodging did not show signs of recovery until early spring, um, but spring is here. We're, we're seeing some positive trends, at least in our region of Charlotte, we're looking to take advantage of those, but we have not fully recovered yet. I mean, we're there are still, uh, I think we're going to be well into the fall before we feel like, you know, can, can, if current trends persist, we're gonna be well into the fall before we feel like uh, we've, we've really turned a corner. So what resources can I recommend? Never stop learning. Um, I, my wife, Amy, is a, just she's just a voracious reader she will sit down with the tenacity i've never seen anybody and she will devour books uh in the traditional way i love reading but i prefer to read on my ipad or i prefer audible um through amazon or you know um any way that you can i do recommend that you read a bunch and read these books um i'm not going to go through them all individually but in, in for one reason or another, these books have really helped us move forward for in the business and as a partnership um, with Social Pet. Websites, I've said the word Investopedia way too many times already. I'm gonna say it again, because if you don't love Investopedia, that's fine, but you need to fall in love with your financials because that is how, at the end of the day, you really make a difference. You cannot carry out your mission if you don't make a profit if you are a for-profit company. If you're not for profit, you still have to make more than you spend, whether that's from donors or from selling of services, you still have to at least break even. So you cannot forget sales and marketing. It's equally important to your operations. Newspapers, uh, the Wall Street Journal, some of the stats I shared with you came from the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. Um, these are US-based publications. Um, but they include a lot of international data that is, is very helpful in understanding what's going on macroeconomically. And then, of course, you want to pay attention locally, your regional paper, your, uh, your um, we have a couple that are local, Axios is a national 
uh, brand that has a digital, uh, essentially digital uh, newspaper that goes out that really helps you stay in tune with what's going on in your city. Um, podcast, the Boss Babe podcast. This is Amy's. She loves it. The Brennan Show. This is also Amy's. Uh, I like the Brennan Show as well. And you'll see up there in books, High Performance Habits by Brennan Burchard. That's the same guy. Uh, very great, very motivational. Um, each of these things individually, though, I would say the books, the websites, the newspapers, the podcasts, just like your financials, they each share some data points. It's up to you to put them all together and to make something of it and extract the data that's most important for running your business. Moving forward, here are five points that I want to leave you with. You are not alone, but if you are, that's on you. I need you to first build a team around you with people who have the expertise that can help you navigate the unknowns, find a bookkeeper, or set aside that time on a weekly basis that is a, a meeting on your agenda that you cannot break where you're going to code and make sure your financials are up to date. And then at least on a monthly basis, you want to have a conversation with your CPA, review the prior month's performance, talk about your future month's projections, and then also pay attention to those financial trends that you both see. And if you don't know why something is trending in the way it is, that's where you wanna do some investigation and know what is impacting these numbers so that you can impact them positively in the next month. Take each decision point seriously, even the small ones. So just like you wanna have a detailed chart of account, you wanna know, you wanna have a detailed process for trimming a dog's nails. You wanna have a detailed process for taking an incoming new client call. Every one of those things are very important. And if anyone, if, if you drop the ball on any one of those, you're, you're not going to have that recurring client raving fan base that you want to have. Lead your team and business partners toward understanding why your business exists. If you're not working for something greater than your paycheck, you're probably not going to be in business for long. And if you are, you might not be that happy doing it. Um, the book Start With Why, Simon Sinek helped me understand and us understand at Social Pet that we exist to enrich the lives of dogs and the relationships they share with those who love them. That is why we exist. That is why I'm talking to you today. And that is the passion that we move forward uh, within this industry. So you wanna be passionate and knowledgeable about your financial statements, sales, marketing. I just mentioned that um, I'm not saying that operations isn't critical but these things are just as critical. So you wanna become just as familiar and just as comfortable with them. And then the last thing, if you all have heard the term work on your business, not just in it, what I mean by this is do, making sure your accounting and your financials are up to speed and, and reviewing the data and extrapolating data that helps you make decisions uh, that move your business forward, that's working on your business. If you have to go scoop poop because somebody did not show up when they were supposed to show up, you may very well need to do that to take care of those clients in that in that time of day. But that's working in your business. That may get you through that day, but it's certainly not doing a whole lot for you tomorrow. So as a business owner, as a business leader, even if you're a sole proprietor and you're running your own uh, van, you know, grooming van, for example, um, you want to really pay attention to what is, you know, what do you got to do to make your paycheck that week? But what are you actually doing to work on your business to know that you're being more efficient in, the, in your future? Um, and the greatest, greatest way to do that is to, is to start prioritizing time for yourself, take care of yourself, and start looking at your business from 10,000 feet up and work on it a little bit, not just in it. I am very blessed and thankful, Jess, for you to have me. And uh, that concludes what I wanted to share with you all today. Yeah, fantastic. Like I said, lots of great feedback for this topic. So again, thank you. Um, if you have just a couple of minutes to run through a couple questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, this is a quick one. What third-party messaging system do you use? You so there is, we, and I'm happy to share this, um, we use Ginger and uh, Ginger um, uh, lodging uh, boarding software. Uh, they have a messaging system, but through Ginger, we also use uh, Broadly. So Broadly is, um, it's, uh, it's integrated into Ginger. It's a separate standalone company, but they help us 
uh, seek feedback from clients on the spot. So when you check out from Social Pet, you're gonna be sent a little reminder. It can be a text or an email that asks you how we did. If you liked us, it's gonna send you directly um, to uh, make a, you know, to give us feedback or make a review. If, if you weren't happy for whatever reason or you had uh, feedback you wanted to give us directly, you do have the option to email us or it essentially sends us a message directly. You can also go on our website and chat with us. Um, that feature is through Ginger. Um, so that's all done behind the scenes. Um, we had our website done by a group called Market Hardware that is fairly well known in the industry. We, we love it. It's very intuitive and they also helped us integrate all of this. Thank you. Some great recommendations there. Um, the next question is going back quite a bit in your presentation. Um, what is the difference of your non-labor cost of goods, such as cleaning products, versus your expenses of cleaning equipment, R&M, et cetera? That's a great, great question. And this is the essence of the difference. The cost of goods sold for those cleaning supplies would be uh, for example, any detergent soaps, uh, we use uh, health technologies brand, so like a triple two, an eliminator, that would all be cost of goods sold, meaning it require you, for you to deliver that service within that month period or the day that dog was there, you needed to use that supply that day to deliver that service when you cleaned right. up after that dog. An example of something that would be in the expense side is say the the wand that you use to spray that product down, it typically lasts, you know, maybe it lasts six months or a year. It broke that month. Well, you're going to replace it, but you're also going to continue to use it until it breaks the next time. That would be an example of an exp a cleaning expense or say your mop heads or your mop buckets. You're going to use those for more than a month or two. Um, those are things that are going to uh, be there for you. Uh, for a longer period of time, they're not in your cost of goods sold. Got it. Um, one last question, and and I know you mentioned you weren't a CPA, and this question might be too specific, and and you you can also uh, answer with that. But it was a question that came in. Uh, my accountant moved my labor costs to expenses from cost of goods that another accountant had set up for me years ago. Do you think that was the right action, or does it really matter? That is so this comes into personal preference. Um, accountants, in my experience, in some cases can kind of be like dog trainers, meaning uh, you know, they're certainly we, we're going to assume that your accountant is putting you their best foot forward. They have some very solid reasoning behind making that change. And if they didn't articulate that to you clearly, that is worth a question. It, it, we actually did the opposite. We moved uh, labor. Uh, all of our labor, except for our manager, uh, and we have a director of operations, those two roles would be in uh, the expense side. Everything else is in cost of goods sold, your groomer, your trainer, your assistant manager on down, um, because I want to see uh, every, pretty much every time a payroll comes around, I want to see how efficient we were with those labor dollars that it took to deliver that service. To me, in our service industry, that constitutes cost of goods sold and, and and I we made that change prompted by our CPA uh, and and a financial consultant we had at the time, and I, I certainly if I when we set up our second locations uh, P and L we set it up that way uh, and it's been very helpful to us. Um, I would hesitate to recommend that you make a change back or that you would do anything though before you talk to your CPA. Maybe share with them what you heard from here and just say, you know, ask that question. Why did we do this? If if I want to understand how effect how efficient I was at using my labor on a month-to-month -month basis, if we have it set up that way, how do I do that? And if they're able to answer that, if they're able to produce the data that you need to make good decisions, then it it, it works. At the end of the day. You want it to be in a format that you can understand and that makes sense to you and that you can make decisions by. And, and being aligned with your CPA in that effort with your financials is really important. 
Got it. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, so Bill Hillis from Social Pet Hotel, we really appreciate having you here uh, today. We know you're a busy guy, um, but appreciate the time and um, appreciate everybody's attendance today. Finally, the CEU code again, C is in cat, C is in cat, 210228. Bill, thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Jess. See y'all.